Craig Russell. You're the author of the Cli-Fi novel I've been reading lately called Fragment. Um, why don't you tell me a little about yourself and how you started writing Cli-Fi and what led you to become an author? So uh, my career outside of writing mm -hmm. was as a lawyer. I uh, worked in the field of land titles and ended up being uh, the district registrar for land titles for an area of about <clears throat> 5,000 square miles of Manitoba. Hmm. Um, I got interested in theater in my 40s. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about theater is saying those beautiful words, you start to think how wonderful it would be if you could write interesting and beautiful mm -hmm. words yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's an it's a easy hobby to get into. Sure. Uh, there's not a lot of cost to writing, so I sat down <laughs> and started writing. I ended up with a first novel, which was published in 2010, which was quite successful. Mm. Uh, won some awards, uh, got noticed in a lot of interesting places. And I also <clears throat> uh, was in parallel with that writing fragment, uh, which is about a, a climate uh, catastrophe. So mm. it's a it's a crisis novel, yeah. uh, written kind of in the flavor of a thriller. Um, the thing that started me writing about it was um, in my twenties. I spent a summer in the Canadian Arctic. Okay. I, as a university student, I had a job at a weather station in the high Arctic at a place mm. called Mold Bay. <clears throat> <laughs> Sounds lovely. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was quite interesting me and about 20 other guys wow. and <clears throat> you arrive and the sun uh, never appears above the horizon for weeks it's totally dark mm. and the ice on the bay is 25 feet thick wow. <clears throat> and then the sun comes up and it goes around and around just the horizon until it's finally in the sky all the time mm. and you get this um, feeling for a world that's so different from what we live in, yeah. uh, in our daily lives, <clears throat> as all that ice melts under the constant sun. Mm. So I, I remain interested in uh, Arctic and Antarctic issues for yeah. many decades. And then in uh, um, 2006, Canada elected a climate denial prime minister, Mr. Mm. Stephen Harper. Okay. And I was, I was quite dismayed about that and yep. I felt <clears throat> like uh, writing would give me a response to mm. that and the res result was uh, oh, uh, I took a long time with with writing fragments so yeah at that time the term cli-fi didn't even exist okay I didn't know what it was but I, was I knew that it was about, about that. Mm. Uh, climate change and global warming was the term at, at the time yeah so um, I had followed issues to do with the Larson ice shelf breakups. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now we have Larson C, which broke off of yes. the peninsula uh, about a year ago. But before mm -hmm. that, there was Larson A and B, which were pretty impressive um, releases of the glacial ice sheet off of Antarctica. Okay. And my interest in science fiction um, <clears throat> as a writer um, makes me think about what if. So these things are tremendous, but what if something bigger happened? And the bigger for me was the Ross Ice Shelf, which is yeah. further south, closer to the pole, far thicker than Larson's uh, ice sheet is, mm -hmm. far bigger. And what would happen if a piece of ice the size of France uh, <laughs> let go and entered the circulatory system of the Earth's currents? Mm. Where would it go? What would it do? Yeah, that's Ross... a long start. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That's all interesting. Um, Ross, the Ross Ice Sheet, that is the largest ice sheet in Antarctica. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you think of Antarctica, mm -hmm. it's like a big cookie with a bite taken out of it. <laughs> and that bite <clears throat> is the Ross Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the Ross Sea is the Ross Ice Shelf. It's named okay. after 
Captain James Ross, who was a, a British explorer who spent mm -hmm. a lot of time um, discovering things about <clears throat> Antarctica. Yeah, interesting. The, shi the ships that he had were what are referred to as bomb ships. Okay. Uh, not because they were actually bombs. <clears throat> mm -hmm. They were wooden ships that would carry mortars to fire <coughs> bombs inside oh, okay. of forts. Mm -hmm. And so, <coughs> excuse me, they were built to be especially strong with extra beams inside to deal okay. with the, the recoil. And the ships that he had, had, one of them was the Terror. And the Terror actually was part of the British attack on Baltimore. Oh, that resulted <laughs> great. In the American <laughs> national anthem. Cool. <laughs> so, so the bombs bursting in air, yeah. air are uh, uh, were partially fired by the terror. Okay. And it had quite a quite a life. It it was in Antarctica, yeah. but it also went into uh, the Canadian Arctic as well with the lost hmm. expedition of Sir John Franklin. Wow, it's been all over the place. That it was uh, sure, sure has. Was that the War of eighteen twelve, or am I getting it that was, mixed up? Yeah. Okay, nope, that's what I thought. Right. That is. Yeah. <laughs> Here I am asking you questions about American history. <laughs> Canadians seem to pay a lot of attention to America. Really? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know. A book that um, reading your book reminded me of, which um, was the Overstory by Richard Powers, which um, was one of the best books I've read in a really, really long time, and you know it's gone on to win a lot of awards too, but you know, I was, as I was reading fragment, um, I was thinking to myself that there were a lot of elements of it that reminded me of the overstory, which, um, is good in my mind because I thought that was an excellent piece of literature. Um, but also like just the, um, the way the story was told, um, some of the characters that were in the story, not necessarily that they were the same characters, but similar in a way. Um, so I guess what I'm talking about is, in Fragment, we switch back and forth between multiple viewpoints, between multiple different characters. Same sort of situation, the overstory. I think like the first, gosh, I don't know how many hundreds of pages. It's such a tome, but um, it's all devoted to just, you know, introducing you to the characters, giving you their backstory. And then also in Fragment, we have non-human characters, which I always think is super fascinating. Um, and then in the overstory, you could also argue that trees are kind of like characters. So I know some of um, Richard Power's reasoning for why he decided to do that, but I'm curious to hear your take on that, why you decided to structure your book that way. I think it's probably similar. In order to tell okay. a story of that size, <clears throat> you have to come out at it from multiple points of view. Mm -hmm. And so if you just have one character, how can they possibly... Um, uh, be in all of the places where all of the important things that are happening take sure. place. Mm -hmm. So, so the the fragment for me uh, is is the focus of the story, mm -hmm. but the side story of Ring the Blue Whale uh, surprised me and how important it came to me as I, I wrote the yeah. book. Um, for me, stories always evolve. You write what you think is going to happen, and mm -hmm. then you discover what really happens. So yeah. <clears throat> at first, I expected Ring was just going to die in the first oh, okay. 10 pages of the book. That would have been sad. But <laughs> it would have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would have missed him terribly. Yeah. But <clears throat> he was, as as I thought about him, he was smart, mm -hmm. and he, was, uh, he had a lot of heart, and he yeah. started doing things which led him to play a, a larger and larger role in the book. Sure. Um, a lot of authors like like Neil Gaiman have remarked on yeah. how re reading develops empathy in the reader mm -hmm. because yep. you occupy the mind <clears throat> of other people. Yes. And to occupy the mind of another species, one hopes would develop even more empathy for the natural world. And yeah. I felt I needed that point of view. The the world isn't just us, and it's good to connect with uh, another creature. The the multiple characters also allow you to explore uh, uh, people who you might admire, mm -hmm. people who 
uh, have good qualities but are flawed, people who are just despicable, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, and, and and some of whom redeem themselves uh, sure. later in the story. I also find that um, you can describe the death of a hundred thousand people, yeah, but there's no connection unless it's a character that you've uh, built some kind of empathy for. Mm -hmm. uh, with that many characters, you can put a lot of people at uh, risk of death. Yeah. Uh, you can have a character die and it's not the end of the story. Mm. Interesting. So, so in an ensemble, it lets you do more. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right in saying that it's climate change is not just about us. You know, we're living in a time when a lot of people are saying we're in a sixth mass extinction event right now. Um, you know, like we're projected to lose millions of species if we don't take serious action on climate change. And it's already underway, unfortunately. Um, but I think a lot of the times we don't always think about animals. And like one key moment that stands out in my memory was last year when the Australian bushfires were really bad. Uh, there was this one photo that kept coming up. It was a koala that had been saved from the bushfires. And I think it actually did end up dying, but that was kind of a moment when I felt like people were starting to realize that, Oh, like this just doesn't just affect humans. Like this has pretty serious implications for all life on earth. Um, so I think that adding ring to the story does a lot to do that. Um, and I think it's interesting how you talk about ring in the book because, I mean, well, I think when people think of whales, I, people know that they're intelligent, but they don't necessarily think about them the way that you write about ring, I think. Um, you give him, like, autonomy. He makes decisions. Uh, he, he's, like, scared for fellow members of his species. And you were saying like get in the mind of other people. And then you said, get in the mind of an animal. And I think that we don't always think of animals as having minds in the same way that humans do, but they do experience some sort of consciousness and we really have no way of knowing what that's like. So I think that's great that you yeah. wrote it that way. One of the um, interesting <clears throat> things that came after the book was published was mm -hmm. I had some correspondence with a scientist from uh, NOAA, the National yes. Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Mm -hmm. His name is Dr. Uh, Bob Pittman. Okay. And he and his scientific partner were on an expedition in the Antarctic Ocean, and they were observing the behavior of <clears throat> humpback whales. Yeah. The uh, altruistic behavior of humpback whales. And they uh -huh. took film and photographs of these whales. And the whales would encounter <clears throat> a situation where a group of orca killer whales were hunting a, a seal. And the mm. seal would be on a little ice flow trying to escape from them. Yeah. And the uh, the orcas would go up and crash onto the ice yeah. floe and make the seal come off. And because the humpback whales were so much faster and more maneuverable, they would swim in, hmm. turn on their backs and grab the whale, what? basically in the armpit of their forefin <laughs> and wow. sweep the thing away from the, the killer whales. And they observed this wow. over and over again. And you would expect a whale to defend its own young. Right. But they were defending another species that they were empathizing with. Wow. And um, it, it's uh, it's a wonderful thing to see that. Mm -hmm. I, I think people um, in their everyday lives, they see the animals that they deal with, their dog right. or their cat. Sure. And they can see in that creature's eyes intelligence. Yeah, they know that it's listening to them, or in the case of cats, sometimes not listening to them. <laughs> I was about to say, I have two cats. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but but but, but the, you know, they look at you and you think there's something going on inside right. of that creature, yeah. and and we shouldn't be so arrogant as to think the world belongs to us mm -hmm. for us to use as 
uh, in in whatever way we like. Yeah. Um, you, you and I are are different ages, obviously. Right. When I when I was born, there were half as many people in the world as there are now, which absolutely stuns me. Yeah, because that's crazy to think about. I w- you know, we thought when I was a young man, mm-hmm. you know, it was like three and a half, four billion people. This is right. a lot of people. Yeah, and, and the world that uh, people from my generation and older. Mm-hmm. have fixed in their mind is a world that doesn't didn't have as many people huh. and didn't exploit the world so much and yeah. didn't demand so much of the world as it does now mm-hmm. and so i i think one of the things that we do in fiction is we uh we imagine and we share that imagination with others whose minds may be still stuck mm. in an earlier time. Yeah. So, so I was trying to take myself into not only the present, but the future with this, this story mm. and think of what, um, what does it mean to have so many people, to have so much at risk? Mm-hmm. When a storm would hit the coast of the U.S. Mm-hmm. 60 years ago, there weren't as many people living on the coasts there. The, the people didn't build their houses and their great big cottages yeah. on, on the fragile sand dunes at the front of the, of the land. Mm-hmm. And so the storms could crash onto those barrier uh, mm-hmm. dunes and so on. Yeah. And not, not so many people were at risk, but now we're right in it. Yep. At every place. <laughs> Going back to what you said about when you were growing up, you know, there were about like three and a half billion people on the earth. I don't, I can't remember what we're up to now. I think it's almost or around 8 billion, if I'm correct. Yes. Yeah. I and, think I, so. and I think the last article that I was reading about this, I think we were supposed to read. I'm totally going to mess this up, but I, I think it was saying we're probably going to reach like peak, peak population around like 12 billion or something like that. I'll have to go back and check my numbers. You might know that. Yeah. But. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of, sounds about right to me. Yeah. Tons of people, but yeah, it, um, reminded me of a conversation I was having with my grandfather one time who doesn't believe in global warming. Um, he's, of you know, like an older generation where like just a lot of like the media he consumes and, you know, like growing up in Georgia and a very conservative environment, uh, I guess kind of primed Mm -hmm. to not believe in it, but, um, I mean, he was from a time when there were even fewer people on the earth than from when you were a young man. So I remember him distinctly saying, um, he was like, Forrest, like, there's no way this is real. Like, humans could never have that much of an impact on the earth. And I was like, well, they did. (laughs) And um, they do. And so it's interesting. I hadn't really ever thought of that until I was talking to him about it. But I was like, oh, like. I never considered that. It's 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 funny to me because uh, I I live in the middle of Canada. Yes, uh, the, the prairies, and mm-hmm. so when you fly over the prairies, you see the grid of mile roads, yeah. the farms that are squares mm-hmm. for hundreds of miles. You fly over them. Mm-hmm. There is human impact that you can see with your own eyes. Yeah, we transformed what was a plane into all these parcels of land. Yeah. It's weird looking. It's, it's a significant impact on the world. It is. Um, yeah. And we, you know, we look up in the sky and we can see mm-hmm. the sun and the moon and the stars and we feel as though the sky is infinite, but yeah. really the atmosphere is not. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things about, you know, the atmospheric pressure mm-hmm. from the atmosphere above us, is equal to if you dove into the ocean about 10 feet down. Yeah. And so really the air above us is uh, made up of an amount of matter that's about the same as a layer of 10 feet of water. That's crazy. And all the pollution that we have produced and continue to produce Mm -hmm. keeps getting put out into the equivalent of a layer of 10 feet of water 
And if you're in the swimming pool and someone pees wow. in the pool, you're upset <laughs> about that. And, and, and we should be just as upset about the pollution that we, we all mm. create. And I, I'm very hopeful, you know, about the new energy sources that yeah. we continue to develop. I'm hopeful about the uh, divestment movement. Yeah. Uh, that it's where institutions are recognizing that they should get out of the oil business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that hope, an... hope is an important thing. I try sure. to end the story of Fragment with some hope. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a disaster story. Yeah. Uh, as part of the editorial uh, process with Fragment, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the publisher was very helpful to me. Okay. Uh, at one point, he said to me, uh, you cannot show this disaster without killing a lot of people. Yeah. And so I added uh, some mega deaths towards the end of the mm -hmm. story. Okay. Uh, which also has to be matched with the death of one of the characters in order for it to be meaningful. But yeah. you can't show a disaster without a lot of death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many things that I think about when you say, um, you know, like you can show a, a mass death event and it not really mean much to people. If it's not tied to a certain character, it has to be kind of on a personal level. And it's like your Australian fires yep. and the koala makes it exactly. personal. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I just can't help but think of the pandemic right now because in the United States, like we're nearing, uh, we're coming pretty close to 400,000 casualties from complications of COVID, <sighs> which is yeah. almost the same number of people who died in World War II from the United States, which is just crazy. Yeah. But still, mm -hmm. it just doesn't seem to register for a lot of people. And I think it's just that it seems like a number. It's an abstraction sort of, which is awful. Because, mm -hmm. you know, like every single one of those people was an individual with like a family and a life and, you know, like hopes and dreams. And But when you mm -hmm. see it uh, framed that way, it I don't think it like really hits home for people as much. I don't, there's something wired in our brain that maybe is trying to protect us from that or something but yeah so stories are incredibly powerful and in helping to shape public opinion on these sorts of issues yeah yeah it, america and canada share um, share stories about themselves mm. about the endless open frontier yeah where there's always another forest that you yes. can cut trees from mm -hmm. there's always more land that you can move to yep um, Brazil <clears throat> uh, has similar ideas. I, I corresponded with a professor in Brazil. They invited mm -hmm. me, but that was pre-COVID to go to sure. a, a climate fiction conference. So that's oh, been cool. put okay. off to the future. Yeah. But you can see as, as they're sending more people into the Amazon and they're just cutting and yep. burning and cutting and burning as though it's going to go on forever. Uh, um, we need to tell ourselves the stories about how the, uh, the earth deserves our respect. The animals deserve our respect and that we're richer mm -hmm. for having a good earth than we are for having an extra car or house or <laughs> bigger bank account. Sure. Yeah, I totally agree with you. That's interesting that you said that about Brazil. I hadn't thought of that before, but you know, the United States and Canada both being very, very large countries, like being two of the largest countries in the world. Um, that is um, like a, a cognitive distortion that we have that like, Oh, we can just keep, you know, like westward expansion or like we can always just, you know, keep going. You move. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I you were saying, I think you put it really well when you were saying that, you know, if you look at our entire atmosphere, it's like 10 feet of water. Um, and I love the, the metaphor of somebody peeing in the pool. That's pretty funny. I'll have to remember that. But um, I was um, pretty interested 
by all the science in the book and it is a work of science fiction, but, uh, you go into a lot of detail. Um, it was a lot of things that I didn't know before. I, th- I thought it was really fascinating. So, um, I'm wondering what the research process was like for that. And you said you took a while to write the book. So I'm wondering if maybe that was why or part of it. So yeah, curious about that. Yeah. Uh, it, yes. I, I found so many things that fascinated me along the way in writing the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I felt like I needed some way uh, to share that uh, because they're, they're, I find learning new things exciting. And I think mm-hmm. uh, when I look back at the books that I've enjoyed, they've always uh, taught me something bes- besides just the enjoyment of the story. Mm-hmm. And so uh, as I worked with uh, the editor, uh, he uh, uh, saw the, these these pieces, uh, which we just called the facts. Sure. And so uh, he, rather than having um, an info dump by a character, you know, in yeah. sort of not very good uh, science fiction, you'll have the professor who gets yes. asked a question who then explains how such and such works. <laughs> I mm-hmm. just set them aside and I said, this is really interesting. I can tell it, mm. this to you in the form of nonfiction for yeah. this piece. And it, it reflects uh, backwards into the story. So you understanding some, understand something more deeply yeah. or it reflects further into the story so that when the characters encounter something, there's no stop in the flow of action to talk about this. Mm-hmm. You already know that in a way you go with it. Yeah. Um, Things like the, the way waves develop, I thought yeah. was so amazing. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that before I read the book, actually. Yes. Yeah, and, and very cool. You know, it's about the strength of the wind, the duration of the wind, and the most fascinating thing to me, given the place in the world these people were going to, mm-hmm. what is the fetch, which is the distance the wind can travel before it hits land because all around the bottom of the world, all the way around Antarctica, Mm -hmm. there's nothing for it to crash (laughs) into. So a wave can get as big as it possibly can. And that, that's, that just, you know, it opens up inside the story. So when the characters are in that ocean, Mm -hmm. you know, this is not a joke what they're going through. This, mm-hmm. this kit is the worst it can possibly be. Right. Yeah, I found that really interesting, too. I didn't know that about the way that waves were formed. Um, I guess I'd probably learned that back in grade school a number of years ago, but forgotten it since. And once you see it, it's obvious to you, right? Yeah. You, you, you go to a lake, and the waves never get very, very big. You go to yep. the ocean, and they can be huge. The Pacific mm-hmm. Ocean waves yes. are, can yeah. be amazing. Uh huh. Yeah, I um, obviously from Georgia, grew up on the Atlantic coast, but um, the first time I'd actually seen the beach at the Pacific, we went on vacation to um, Mexico. We went to Puerto Vallarta a number of years ago. Yeah, and we were like, oh, let's go swimming. So we were swimming in the ocean, and I didn't realize how big the waves got. So we actually nearly got swept out, and it was actually kind of terrifying. But um, yeah, they get very, very, very big. So yes, we've been there as well. And yeah, my there God, were a lot of Canadians there. Not it's funny. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> very popular spot. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So I was going to say when I was reading the book, um, it was helpful that you explained that because then I think one of the following scenes after that explanation or maybe just before it is we see some of the characters getting on, um, a boat. It's a, you know, smaller boat and captain by the Scotsman. Oh, I forget his name, but Um, they're going, yes, they're going out to sea and as you're describing like how big the waves are, I always knew that that area, um, I always get them mixed up. The Cape of Fear is South America. Cape of Good Hope is Africa, I think. That's right. Yes. So, um, Cape Horn, I think they call the the Horn, uh, is the way I've always heard South America described. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've, I've known just from school and history class that that's a very dangerous passage um it's i think it's the drake passage 
um, mm-hmm. is what it, they're going across in the book. But yeah, I didn't, it didn't occur to me how huge the waves could get until <laughs> you had that explanation there in yes. the book. And I was picturing, you know, like crashing waves out on the ocean and yeah, even just seeing the waves coming in on the beach in Mexico and how huge those were. So, but, mm-hmm. um, I say all of that to um, bring up the iceberg floating in and it actually breaking the fetch or at least um, right. like stalling it. And yes. that was, um, I thought that was like a great use of scale to show how like, oh, it's, you know, all of this about how waves are created, but then um, suddenly the sea is calm in a place that is known for being very violent and it's because of this iceberg the just the sheer magnitude of it has actually calmed the seas basically mm-hmm. yeah it's like 700 meters thick it's just a, wow. an incredible depth of, of ice <clears throat> in the in the ross sea well we were talking about the facts and one of the things yeah. that, that uh uh, the book opens with is talking about <clears throat> the resilience of ice, how hard yes. it is mm-hmm. to melt ice. And <clears throat> one of the things people don't think about is the opposite of that, mm-hmm. how much energy water has to lose to become ice. Mm-hmm. So as the ice around us in the glaciers and in the Antarctic and the Arctic melts, <clears throat> As ice, it warms to the point of melting, and then mm-hmm. it needs 80 times as much energy to melt. Yeah. But the opposite side of that is also true. As water cools, it reaches almost the point of becoming ice, mm. and it has to lose all that energy, 80 times as much energy mm. that it has to le- lose to become ice again. Mm-hmm. So water... That, that, that's melted or ice that's melted to become water. Mm-hmm. It's not that easy for us to go backwards Yeah, for us to just say, Oh, well, we're going to stop producing quite as much carbon and mm-hmm. things will refreeze. No, yep. that energy is, is in the water and yep. it's going to take a long time. Uh, if we can reverse things for it to, to go backwards, hopefully yeah. you know, you're talking, you're talking about the, um, the events with the Australian, uh, fires, mm-hmm. your grandparents' um, understanding of how the, the world has or hasn't changed. Right. Uh, I live in Manitoba in the middle mm-hmm. of the continent. This past summer, we had a 1,000 year flood. Wow. Well, no, it isn't a 1,000 year flood because. <laughs> Was it like three years ago? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've had similar events happen. Mm-hmm. And, and so that they're no, they're no longer, Oh, this will happen once yeah. in a thousand yep. years. We, we almost had dams break wow. businesses and homes and so on that were never in any danger of flooding were flooded. And then mm-hmm. here we are six months later in January and it's the hottest January we've ever had. Yeah. Manitoba is a cold, cold place in the middle of the winter. It's over freezing. We've had rain huh. in January, Ugh. which is nuts. Yeah. Essent- essentially, the part of the world we live in, <clears throat> uh, the winter is the time when we take all the precipitation as snow. It's stored up. Yeah. So that in the spring when it melts and it's available through the summer, the water is then available for the plants and then it freezes the next uh, the next winter again. Yeah. Without that cycle, we're a desert because oh. if you spread all, all that water through yeah. the year with it out, you know, without building up this reserve of snow, uh-huh. God. Uh, it's, it's a uh, drought. Wow. I didn't, so. I'd never thought of that before. Um, my brother I mentioned lives in Chicago, which is, um, in the Midwest here on the Prairie. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't, I guess I haven't heard him talk too much about the weather there recently, but I do obviously keep up with 
you know, like weather news a lot. And I've been seeing, you know, people talk about flooding in the Midwest and the United States is a really big problem or it's becoming a bigger problem, I should say. Um, and same kind of thing. Right, talking in California. And- yep. Yeah. I didn't know that it would become desert, though. That's terrifying. <laughs> it, it, yeah. It, yeah. It's because uh, uh, the cycle is you take whatever it is. Let's say it's 10 inches of rain that you mm-hmm. get in a year. If you spread that out throughout the year, it's a desert. If wow. you store it up and use it just for those few months of the summer. Yeah. You produce huge amounts of grain and other crops to feed the world. Sure. So it's worrisome for our farmers here. They, they're often looking at, is there enough moisture mm-hmm. in the soil to plant? I know that the Arctic is one of the fastest warming places on the earth. Um, and I would assume the closer you are to the Arctic, the more you probably experience that. Um, has that been I guess a common experience for many Canadians or at least where you live. So, so the, uh, the, the temperature dim- differences here have been mm-hmm. significant. Okay. And the, the part that <clears throat> I encounter is in the winter time when it's, I'll put a quote around this nice. So <laughs> it's zero. That's nice. Uh, that's uh, sorry. Zero in, in centigrade for you guys. Okay, 32. That's what I thought you meant. So, so, yeah. So, so it's a nice day. In January, you go for a walk and it's zero. Wow, this is nice. Yeah. So that is uh, compared with a normal January of 30 below, very average temperature. That's yep. a difference of 30 degrees. Yep. What if you take that extra 30 degrees and you put it in the summer? So in the summer, mm-hmm. when it should be 25 and you make it 55, everyone dies. Yikes. That's and awful. so we're seeing those kinds of temperatures appear in some of the Middle Eastern countries now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, where if you aren't living in air conditioned buildings, yeah. <clears throat> people are dying. It, it makes um, uh, you know, the migration of people because of flooding uh, from rising oceans, like mm-hmm. in Bangladesh and places like that. Uh, this makes those areas where they they aren't going to get flooded by the oceans, but they're going to get so hot that people have to leave to live yeah. somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we'll have more migrations, sure, uh, more dislocation, more conflict. Yeah. And sorry, I just had to look that up just to give myself a frame of reference because unfortunately I am not terribly familiar with uh, centigrade. So I, I should, according to I, Google I 50, use... oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. I don't expect you to yeah. do Fahrenheit. The rest of the world does Celsius and we're, <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but so um, according to Google, 50 degrees Celsius is 122 degrees Fahrenheit, um, yes. which is incredibly hot. So, yeah. So excuse me if I didn't seem incredibly shocked when you first said 50 <laughs> degrees Celsius because I was trying to process that. Yeah. Um, but it, yes. Because it's not only how can people live, it's how can you grow crops and produce yep. food and so on. And yep. I mean, Canada has the, the north. So theoretically, we can mm-hmm. move further and further and further and further north. Yeah. But everyone else is going to be looking for places to live too. Yep. Sorry, I'm not very, I'm not very fun to talk to. Am no, I? no, 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 no. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we're talking about climate change. It's kind of a bleak yes. subject. <laughs> but um, <laughs> going back to what you were saying about um, the farmers in Manitoba looking for moisture levels and stuff. Um, just because that happens in Manitoba, that has a rippling effect throughout the entire world. And I'm sure that Canada probably exports a lot of food to other countries um, since you do have the plains. We do. And lots of farmland. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And that, it, uh, sorry. It's a, a okay. personal concern to me because yep. I grew up on a farm. I yeah. have uh, nine, nine brothers and sisters. My parents were farmers and mm. we worked very hard to yeah. you know, do all the sorts of things that you, you would on a farm, raise mm. chickens and pigs and cows and horses yeah. and uh, you know, till the earth and plant the seeds. And that was how mm-hmm. the 12, 12 of us were able to s- survive, uh, mm-hmm. on a half section of land. And, yeah. You know, uh, I was the youngest of the five boys. I have mm-hmm. also have five sisters. Wow. <laughs> Big family. Um, you grew up there in Manitoba then? 
That's right. Yeah. Okay. On a, on a farm uh, in mm. rural Manitoba. Okay. Uh, I, I've lived uh, almost exclusively in Manitoba. Um, okay. Some excursions like to the Arctic, but yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. Which sounds like quite an adventure. It, it's it's a, it's about as far from the ocean as you can get. And so in the process yes. of uh, <laughs> r- writing the story, mm-hmm. my uh, my imagination had to fill in uh, things. Okay. I, I mean, I, I've been to the ocean, but uh, <laughs> I had to learn about how how uh, sailing works. You yeah. Know, and um, the difference between a breaking wave mm-hmm. and a swelling a swelling wave. Yeah. One, the one will kill you and the other one is safe. Yeah. I was actually wondering about that as I read the book because I knew that you did live um, on the prairie in Canada. So I was kind of wondering <laughs> if there was a lot of research that had to go into um, writing about the ocean, which, by the way, I could not tell. Um, I thought you did a really, really great job with that. And it was very realistic when I was reading it. I also uh, read some books mm. uh, like Captain's Courageous, uh, which yeah. is about a boy at sea and mm-hmm. off the coast of, of New England. Okay. And uh, to get the flavor of uh, mm-hmm. you know, sort of the smells and the, yes. the, the, the sounds of being at sea. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, speaking of reading, you have mm-hmm. a book. Would you like to read some from it? I'd be delighted. Okay. Uh, so, so I'll just uh, read something from on the opening. Okay. Consider the nature of ice. The heat of fusion is one of its mysteries. The heat of fusion governs the transmutation from ice to water. That miraculous moment when H2O changes from solid to liquid. As you heat ice, its temperature rises. The formula is easy. Add one calorie of heat to one gram of ice and its temperature goes up one degree. What could be simpler? But there's a point at which something magical happens just when you reach the temperature where ice melts, 32 degrees Fahrenheit for Americans or zero degrees Celsius for the rest of the world, you hit a strange plateau You can't just add one more calorie and jump from zero degree ice to plus one degree liquid water. No, you must add 80 calories of heat before that amazing change takes place. It takes 80 times the energy to make that important transformation occur. Ice is resilient stuff and it takes a lot of energy to make even a small amount of it melt away. Part one, New York, October 6th. Tonight's satellite feed comes live from Scott Base on the coast of Antarctica. The host of Innovation TV, Jay Traljezic, is slim and tall. In his mid thirties, he has carefully dressed in an open collared shirt and black jeans. He believes he looks like a young professor He'd like to make co-eds weak in the knees. His studio set is an eclectic mix of shark's teeth, samurai blades, and voodoo dolls, artifacts he's collected from around the globe. Behind him, the woman's face, framed by honey blonde hair and dominated by Nordic blue eyes, fills the giant screen. Her slim shoulders are fluid under a black turtleneck. Dr. Kate Sexsmith is a Canadian scientist and expert on the polar ice caps. Hello, doctor, or should I say good morning? It's tomorrow morning where you are, right? Yes, good morning, it's 6.45 a.m. here. The woman blurs and reappears as she adjusts the webcam that captures her image. It's October and spring has arrived. So the sun has been up for over an hour. Doctor, may I call you Kate? Jay consults his notepad. You have news about the ice ship on the ocean. Roald Amundsen, the first person to reach both the North and South Poles, called it the imposing majesty. 
Now she traces the mountain chain that cups the ice sheet. We have sensors on the glaciers that feed the ice shelf to track their movement. She clears her throat and continues more cautiously. Based on the readings, I believe that a series of unusual glacial events are about to happen. The four largest, the Bird, Nimrod, Beardmore, and Shackleton glaciers are about to make major advances. Advances, Jay prompts. Yes, she appears reluctant to elaborate. He senses they are near the end of her prepared information, so he presses. Please explain, doctor. Her microphone catches the squeak of an opening door and Kate Sexsmith tosses a glance off camera. Jay clicks his teeth. Someone has entered her office. Hasn't she been told to keep gawkers out until the interview is over? At least the person has the sense to keep quiet and his guest continues returning to familiar, safer ground. Well, for example, the Beardmore Glacier is over 200 kilometers long, Kate says. Normal flow is about one meter a month. And you're expecting something out of the ordinary, he asks. Her attention turns to the other person in her office. She seems unwilling to go on. Jay waits. Something is up. This woman is struggling for the courage to speak. He leaves the silence open and she fills it. There's a terrible tremor in her voice. The Beardmore may avalanche. A cold tendril of fear touches the base of Jay's spine and she plunges on. And the other three glaciers as well, the same. All four lie in the same geological bed, the same mountain range. She rushes on. One event may try, trigger the others through a kind of resonance in the bedrock. What do you mean? What kind of resonance? She begins a nervous explanation, but is stopped by a long rumbling boom. The web camera convulses, her image dances. The bank of monitors emits a harpy's chorus of warning tones and she disappears from view, Jay and the interview abandoned. Doctor, he calls. One by one, the warning tones snap off and Kate Sexsmith reappears. A printout unreels through her hands and he glimpses fresh red ink jumping across the final page. She looks into the camera. What's happened, he says. Her blue eyes are glassy, her focus inward. He knows that look. Scientists often carry virtual worlds within their own heads, models of the things they've spent years studying, waiting for, hungry for fresh data. Kate Sexsmith has withdrawn into that world. She seeks a depth of understanding only another expert might fathom. Doctor, he calls again. He needs answers and doesn't want her going all rain man on him. Into the hush, the unseen gawker who entered Kate's office earlier mutters a single word, Jesus. The voice is deep and male and carries the accent of an Australian. The squeaky door bangs again, signaling the man's departure. Dr. Sexsmith, Jay persists. You're saying, have I got this right? You're saying that if the Beardmore Glacier falls down the face of the mountain, the woman jerks back from whatever theoretical model she was immersed in and he gets what he wants. It falls into the Ross ice shelf. Yes, she answers. I'll lead a team out to the Beard Glacier. You see, Beard is 24 kilometers wide and closest. On the screen, a broad-shouldered man made larger by an orange parka charges into view. He sports a beard thick and Viking red and strides like a rug rugby halfback, strong enough to make ta tackle lithe and fast enough to carry the ball. He thrusts an identical parka at Kate Sixsmith. Come on, Katie. The voice identifies him as the man who was in the room moments ago, a voice that now rides the sharp edge of panic. Come on, now. She doesn't take the offered coat and he reaches for her arm. She pulls back. What's happening? Jay's question goes unheeded. Kate, Redbeard turns, his face looms into the camera and fills the screen. Then he snags Kate's elbow and hauls her out of sight. Doctor, hello. Jay's face is numb. Is anyone there? No answer. 
Her chair spins in the now empty office and a different kind of emptiness settles into his gut. 10 heartbeats tick by. He ignores the frantic signals from Al in the control booth. The rotating chair slows to a stop. He struggles to face the glass eye of camera two. Startling developments on the Ross ice shelf. He trails off, looks down. His notes hold no answers. Jesus, he repeats Redbeard's comment and collects himself to continue. ITV, I mean, I will, I will. It's the start of a promise cut short. The network has gone to commercial. In the control booth, a screen displays a world of empty highways and untouched beaches where a luxury SUV roams at will while Sting sings a love song to torque and horsepower. Scott Bass. Let go, Kate twists, trying to pull free. Frigid air spills down the, uh, the hallway and a knee-high cold front sweeps past them. Condensation billows around her like an incoming tide. God damn it, Lawson, let go of me. The source of the cold is obvious. The double set of doors at the end of the corridor, normally an airlock against the Antarctic blast, is wide open. A cloud of ice crystals fills the exit. The big red bearded man in the orange parka lets go of her and they stop. Another man whose dark face is hard with indignation has stepped into their path. What the hell, Lawson? The dark man is Graham Palmer, the marine biologist. His work has little crossover with her ice studies, but Kate knows he's not one to tolerate the chaos that fills the corridor. Eric Lawson pulls on a pair of leather mitts. There's going to be a wave, a shock wave, he says to them both, in the ice. The wall near the door is covered with parkas on hooks. Lawson grabs one and throws it at Palmer. I'll get a hag, hurry. Then he is gone through the cloud of ice crystals and out the open doors. The fog eddies and refills his passage. Kate, as Kate watches, Palmer pulls on the heavy winter coat. <coughs> Sorry. She pockets her glasses and steps into a pair of insulated boots. What's he talking about, Palmer? is a native New Zealander. His words are clipped by the cold and by confusion. There's been a glacial avalanche, Kate says. Oh, Palmer's skepticism is evident. Then he moves, not out the open doors, but back into his office. Wait, he says, I'll be right there. But she doesn't wait. She can't. She crosses the foggy threshold, stepping through zero visibility out into the perfect clarity of an Antarctic morning. Lawson is already in the cab of a hag, a Hagland snow crawler. The base has a half dozen of the big snow machines. The other five stand silently nearby, workhorses ready for another day. Each has a red steel crew cab big enough for four, boxy and awkward, perched atop twin caterpillar tracks. They are the last word in polar transportation. Behind Kate, the base's eight buildings are all painted lime green a color meant to give the eye rest from the endless white and gray. It's been her home for 18 months. Established in 1957 under the leadership of New Zealand mountaineer Sir Edmund Hillary, four years after he stood on the summit of Mount Everest, Scott Base was named to honor the ill-fated British explorer Robert Falcon Scott. Built on a sloped promontory that juts a shale, shale chin out into the pack ice just a few meters above sea level, none of the buildings is far from the shoreline. The location is convenient for marine, ice, and land-based studies, and normally Kate would have said that Sir Edmund had made a good choice, but not today. The hag's hot exhaust marks the air. It's a long step up from the Massey Ferguson farm tractors Sir Edmund used on his 1958 drive to the South Pole. People are at the dining, room, dining hall windows, curious about the early morning activity. At one frosted window, she sees Ted and Eva Bowers wave an invitation for her to join them at breakfast. They are a kindly older couple, the unofficial mum and dad of everyone here. At another window, Bill Cherry, the camp administrator, wags a finger at them. 
Come on, Lawson yells over the hag's rumbling engine. Graham Palmer hustles up. I'm not leaving my work. He cradles a laptop computer and a case of CD-ROMs. Kate starts towards the dining hall to warn the others to organize an evacuation. Seen obliquely through the frost, they might be the ghosts of Captain Scott's lost party. Then she feels it. Not the sonic boom she heard minutes earlier before Lawson grabbed her. By comparison, by comparison that had been ethereal. This is elemental. Beyond a narrow range, <clears throat> beyond a narrow range, the ear cannot detect sound. But as any rock concert fan knows, the body itself is a resonance chamber. Kate's chest trembles, a leaf in a sudden storm. For an instant, she knows the shape of her own beating heart more clearly than her tongue knows the inside of her mouth. Who could feel that and not look for the source? Kate and the two men turn south, south towards a marvel that is part of the everyday existence here. The cliff, a hundred meters high, thrusts up out of the ocean. They still call it the barrier. It is the seaward edge of the Ross ice shelf, not a level sheet. The shelf is, a land, uh, is an ice skate where plates the size of suburban neighborhoods shift with seasons shaped by the slow progress of wind and tide. But now she can see swift movement where there should only be frozen stillness all across the southern horizon. The edge of the world lifts. Atlas has shifted his grip on the globe and there is a shock wave in the ice. She cannot estimate the wave's speed, but behind it, the air is filled with sparkling white, a twinkling curtain composed of a billion, billion pieces of broken ice, some as small as a grain of sand, some much, much larger, each hurled glittering into the sky. To know something might happen, and then to see it happen are two very different things. In her lectures on theory versus experience, she likes to quote Mark Twain, who said, it's like the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. The wave is not a perfect line. It is the product of four falling to meet shards of surface ice are launched ahead of the onrushing swell launched like harpoons catapulted forward at the speed of sound. A 12 foot spear of cobalt blue impales a stretch of sand near the hag. Another strikes a rock and both ice and stone explode. More shards pelt down around them, a hail of needles and knives. The camp buildings, sheet metal roofs, thunder, harmonic tenors amid the oncoming roar. More faces join Bill Cherry and the Bowers at the dining room windows. <clears throat> Kate waves frantically, but they seem confused, seeing without understanding. In the clamor, a razor gash appears on Palmer's brown cheek and red splashes across Kate's boots. Then the two of them are inside of the hag's cabin with Lawson. Kate shouts, go, go. Ice fragments punch the crawler's roof. Lawson mashes the accelerator, the engine roars, and the boxy little beast leaps forward. First place means life, but the finish line is unknown. There's no finesse to it, no question of tight corners or delicate handling. It's just scream and drive. It's not here yet, but there's no doubt. The shock wave is coming and fast, like a tsunami where it has plenty of depth. The wave keeps low and quick, touching the foreshore. The front of the wave slows and the rest catches up, catches up and starts to pile up onto itself. In seconds, it transforms great speed into massive height. Kate shuts her eyes a moment. She and the two men are a frost giant's toys given faint hope of seconds more to live. When she looks again, the wave is kneeling before the coast. It stands and stands again, teetering with power. Then it falls on Scott Base. Thank you for reading that. Um, you mentioned earlier that you had an interest in theater. Did you ever um, act at all yourself? Yes, I, I uh, did some acting. And then okay. as uh, 
I took courses and and so on mm. as an amateur actor. Uh, I also okay. ended up directing about uh, a dozen different plays wow. and okay. um, cool. uh, then write writing some uh, theater pieces that have been performed as well. Wow. Yeah, very I, cool. I didn't know that. I had a play performed in Richmond, Virginia, in two thousand nineteen. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. I was going to say, um, you're a very good reader. Um, that was very compelling. Oh, um, thank you. It was a good performance, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, I was just wondering if that had anything to do with it. It does. My aim is to chew the scenery. <laughs> cool. I think you did it. <laughs> well, that was, um, a very action packed scene from the beginning of the book, or I guess a couple of different scenes. Um, and it was about the Ross ice shelf starting to, I guess, calve off from the rest of the ice sheet in Antarctica. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, I know that um, this was actually, I guess, like a couple of weeks ago now, maybe two weeks ago. Um, you actually sent me an email before we had this talk about, I think it was an, another piece of the Larson ice sheet, um, the Larson C ice shelf broke off. Yes. Um, and is heading for, um, I think South Georgia Island is the name of the Island. Yes. Yes. Um, which seemed like really weird timing considering we were about to talk about this. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, um, <laughs> I'm wondering, I mean, not that you like predicted this happening or anything. And I mean, there's certainly science, you know, pointing to events like this happening more often, but what does it feel like to see that in the news after you, you know, wrote a whole book about an event like this? Um, well, <laughs> it made me feel sick. <laughs> uh, okay. it, it wasn't that, uh, <clears throat> I mean, anyone could see these things were going to happen, you know, right. the, the, that the climate is changing and mm -hmm. other pieces have broken off and these things don't just, uh, go into the ocean and melt away every time mm -hmm. this happens. Um, there, there's been some kind of funny things uh, associated with the novel. So uh, mm. the, a month after it was published, uh, Mr. Trump was elected as president. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and, yeah. and when I wrote the book, <clears throat> I included a, a president who was, was pretty callous about the environment yes. and, mm -hmm. and his advisor and they're pretty manipulative yes. and <clears throat> quite a few people have since said to me you know if I had read this before the time of Trump I would have said that this character was a caricature of what a bad president would be and the thing is he's nowhere nearly near as bad as Mr. Trump has been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that thing that happened. And, and, ju Gosh. and just in the news recently, <clears throat> mm. um, there's are reports about the volcanoes in the Caribbean that have become active. So late in the book, there's, God, I haven't heard about this. There are events <clears throat> taking place with the fragment getting close to these islands and mm -hmm. interacting with these islands and uh, in the book i talk about la soufie and ikum jenny which are mm -hmm. volcanoes on or near saint vincent and the grenadines and okay. about a week ago uh, there are reports of new activity with these volcanoes and mm. and they haven't done anything for a hundred years or, or more but Great. When some of these volcanoes have erupted, thousands of people have died, uh, mm. like uh, from uh, pyroclastic flows. It's when the mm. volcano ex exhales uh, superheated yep. gases, and yeah. entire towns, everyone's died. So. Yeah. Anyway, it, when you do research uh, about things, you get connected to the thing itself. Um, yeah. And you notice think these things more, of course. Uh, mm. what, one of the less serious things that happened was uh, while we were in the middle of editing, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, I, I mentioned the Terror earlier, uh, which was one of the yes. British ships uh, that mm -hmm. was exploring Antarctica 
Antarctica and also the Arctic. And the Erebus and the Terror went into the Canadian Arctic and disappeared. And, and so in my original version of the story, there's mention of them. And it says, you know, they disappeared and never were found again. So we're in the middle of editing and uh, Parks Canada announces that they've discovered one of the two ships. So we very what? quickly change <laughs> in the editing. <laughs> you know, this one is found, the other one's never found. And then the book is published and a week later, Parks Canada announces, oh, we found the second one too. <laughs> so, wow. so there's this little factual uh, uh, inaccuracy. Uh, it was true at the time the book was published, but it's no longer the case. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, wow. So many things going on there. Um, yeah, this, um, this kind of made me think another book where I had a similar kind of experience, um, as in things seeming to come true that were, you know, like so-called like foretold in the book, if you will, um, was, and you may have read it, but it was, um, Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents by Octavia Butler. Yeah, um, I, I haven't read them, yeah. read them, but I, I know how okay. important they are. Yes. So, yeah, I was, um, I was reading, I had just read both of them. They were the first two books that I ever talked about on the podcast, but, um, and they, actually they were the first two, um, works of, I guess, climate change fiction, uh, that I'd ever read. Um, even though that was a term that hadn't even been imagined yet when, um, she wrote those books, but yeah, it was so weird because there is, um, in the second book in Peril of the Talents, there is this president who sounds almost, ex he sounds kind of like a mix between like Ted Cruz and Donald Trump, I thought, but he ran on like this campaign slogan, make America great again. And I, I did a double take when I was reading the book and I was like, what year was this published again? <laughs> and of course it was like published in 1990, I think, or 1992. But, um, yeah, I think, um, I bring that up because I think when there, when people read things like that, there is such a temptation to say, um, oh, the author is, you know, like prophetic or like this book is so prescient. Um, yeah. And you're, you're shaking. Your I, head. I, I think, I think people who pay attention can see. Yes. Possible things that come and you notice the things mm -hmm. that match up and you ignore the things that don't. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, that's a good way to put it. But yeah, I was I was going to say, like, I mean, people have been predicting things, not necessarily things like Make America Great Again, but people have been predicting, you know, the events you talk about in your book and a lot of the things that she talked about in her books, too. And mm -hmm. it's just nobody was really paying attention to them until, yeah. you know, it actually happened. And then, you know, looking back, it's, you know, it appears to be like a prophecy, I guess, in some way. So, so can I tell you a personal story of synchronicity? Yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> so, so that's a good word. Sy synchronicity is, is, uh, I know you know what it is, but it's when, mm -hmm. uh, things, uh, that seem connected happen. They don't, yes. they don't really have <clears throat> a cause and effect, but they, they mm -hmm. uh, make you feel that there are these odd connections in, in the, in the world. So, yeah. um, uh, so, so I grew up on my parents' farm, and then I, yes. I went to university in the city of Winnipeg, uh, where I met my wife and uh, her parents. Uh, her dad was a doctor, her mom was an home economist. They were really interested in Manitoba history, and so they bought mm -hmm. a historic house <clears throat> uh, and turned it into a museum. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the people who had owned the house uh, the fellow's name was Captain William Kennedy, and mm -hmm. he was an Arctic explorer. And so when mm -hmm. Sir John Fran Franklin took the Erebus and the Terror up to the Canadian Arctic and they got lost, mm -hmm. Lady Jane Franklin, his wife, was this very determined woman, and she got expedition after expedition sent in search of Franklin, like 17 mm -hmm. different expeditions. And she got Captain Kennedy to lead two of them. So he, wow. he's a guy from Manitoba, just a few miles from, from where I'm living now. So mm -hmm. um, uh, later, uh, the, the family sold the museum to the, the province. 
And I would, uh, but before then, I, I, as Janet's boyfriend, I would go and help her do the, uh, uh, the tours of, of the museum. Uh, yeah. I, I got a law degree. Uh, we moved to a small town called Verdon in Western Manitoba, where I started to practice mm-hmm. law. And then we moved to Brandon, Manitoba, where I also practiced law. And then I got hired by the, the government to uh, be what's referred to as the district registrar of land titles for Brandon. Okay. It's about 5,000 mm-hmm. square miles. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it's a pretty uncommon job since uh, the area was settled 125 years ago. There have been maybe mm. eight or nine district registrars. People generally stay with the job like 20 years, not very many people. Okay. So I'm working on this, this book, Fragment, and I, I see, oh, there's Ross Island and Ross Ice Shelf, and I learn about who mm. this Ross guy is, and he's a British naval officer, and oh, he's he's got these... Uh, the Erebus and the Terror down there. And I've heard of these because they, they got lost in the Canadian Arctic. Hmm. And Captain Kennedy was sent in search of those, My the museum of my in-laws guy. Yeah. And, and how, you know, synchronous is this? Yeah. And then after the book is published, I learn that after Captain Kennedy died, he... Uh, his wife and their son moved to the town of Verdon, where Janet mm. and I had been living, mm-hmm. for him to become the district registrar of land titles, for the son to have the same job that I had a hundred years later, and for, like, I was there 17 years, for all these years, I was looking at documents with this guy's signature on it. Wow. from 100 years ago and we had both worked in the same place and his father had gone to the arctic in search of this person mm. uh, life is is full of these wonderful little tales that don't really mean anything but they they're entertaining <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> what is the literal translation i think it's happy coincidence is that what yes. it is or yes. something mm-hmm. like that yeah. that's cool that is a weird a uh, way that you were related, but that works great for the purposes of your book. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Going back to, I guess, um, heads of state. Um, so you were talking about um, when you first started writing Fragment, I think you said it was 2006, and there was a climate denying prime minister elected to Canada, yes. or excuse me, elected as prime minister of Canada. Um, and to me, that sounds kind of, uh, it sounds funny to me, to be honest, because as an American, uh, we honestly kind of, or at least I look at Canada as this much more progressive, like you have your stuff way more together. Um, you know, we have health care. We've had, yeah, you have health care. <laughs> we have universal health care and we look at the United yes, States exactly. and go, it works. It's not I expensive. <laughs> it works. People are not you know, denied amazing co- coverage. Mm-hmm. There, I mean, if I need to yeah. go see a doctor, I go see see a doctor. I yes. I had a heart attack four years ago. I oh, had great ahead. treatment right away. Like it's That's terrific. Good. The rest of the world yeah. is doing this. And I know. But but I wish we were doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I really, really wish we were doing it. So that's I, a side, I made side a tweet topic. the other <laughs> Yes. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's weird to me to hear you say that there was a climate denying prime minister of Canada because now um, I think I probably grew up mostly knowing Justin Trudeau, who is um, I mean he's he liberal, at least talks a good game. <laughs> yes, he at least talks a good game is what I would say. But um, but, um, but to my ears, like that is huge compared to Donald yes. Trump and. Yes. Um, you know, like even the past two presidents before him and certainly like President Obama did a lot of good things for the environment. But I mean, you could say now that, you know, he could have done more. But, you know, at the time, I guess it, it was um, seemed like pretty progressive policy, some of the things that he was doing. But um, I'm wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about that more and like what was your inspiration for um, Fragment and maybe what was going through your mind? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so um, uh, one of the things that was going on under uh, the Harper government was they were silencing scientists. They uh, sounds familiar. Yeah, so this is uh, 2006, and uh, they, you know, the press normally contacts scientists. What's your opinion about this? Climate change is a big issue. Can you talk to us about this? And mm -hmm. Canadian environmental scientists and scientists studying virtually everything, you know, like how is the fishery doing? I am not permitted to say anything. I cannot mm -hmm. provide you with any data because the government has said, if I do, I will be fired. And in what should be a pluralistic Western liberal democracy where mm -hmm. policy decisions in government are made based on information. If the population doesn't know what's going on, mm -hmm. uh, you can't make a, uh, you can't vote in a way that uh, is based on the facts. So mm -hmm. it, it was truly horrendous to, to have this happening. Um, mm -hmm. and Canada's history has, has often been, uh, one of, uh, ex exploration and exploitation of, uh, yeah. land. So, um, uh, Western Canada has a lot of oil production. Uh, yep. it's, it's made the province of Alberta at times very wealthy and now with the, mm -hmm. uh, very low price of oil, it's made them radical. Uh, so they have a very conservative premier, the least mm -hmm. popular politician in Canada. I, I believe he's the, the least popular premier right now because of his mishandling okay. of COVID and other things. But their, okay. their province uh, hired for at the cost of millions of dollars, people to run a uh, climate denial war room so these people yep. would issue you know statements to the press and so on it's a lot like um oil company fan fiction is the way i describe it <laughs> that's a good way to put it yeah so so it's you know let's hire this guy uh he'll write a report for us we'll put out the report and the report really isn't based on anything other than this fellow reiterating oil is good. It's good for jobs. It's good for Alberta. Yeah. Let's keep going. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of Canada's reputation is based on uh, good reputation is based on things that we've done in the past. Well, like, <laughs> yeah, but like peacekeeping troops in uh, difficult places around the world in sure. Uh, helping develop the existence of the United Nations um, yeah. in developing things like the Salk vaccine for polio. You know, yeah. Canada, mm -hmm. Canada had, has had some great scientific uh, people in, yes. in the past, um, mm -hmm. but a number of uh, uh, years with, I would, I would say, not traditionally conservative but ultra conservative mm -hmm. governments have led to some very weird things. Uh, Canada had uh, the Canadian Wheat Board, which was this thing that farmers loved. They, mm -hmm. it, they owned it. It was their cooperative where they pooled all of their wheat together and they said to the world, mm -hmm. we will sell this to you, not as individuals, but as this enormous bargaining unit. So we can say, okay. you want our wheat, you pay us top dollar. So yeah. during the Harper years, they sold the Canadian wheat board to mm. Saudi Arabia. What? Exactly. What? Saudi Arabia. <laughs> what? Huh. The farmers didn't want them to sell it, but they did what? it and they voted against selling it, but they did it uh. anyway. And so uh, very anti-democratic uh, yeah. and, and the result is uh, the friends of the government 
got money uh-huh. and the people that they should be, that they claim to represent, like, you know, the rural farmer, we're all for the rural farmer, mm-hmm. got screwed. Very sad. That sounds like uh, pretty similar to what's going on here <laughs> in a lot of ways yeah. and has been going on, I should say, for quite a long time. Yeah, the sale, the um, sale of public assets, like closures of parks. Yeah. Um, hmm. Alberta is closing parks and selling them. Really? Selling provincial parks is madness. Are they selling them to oil companies or what are they? No, they're selling them to private, just private, private companies who will then run the parks at a profit. Oh, okay. Like privatizing them. Yeah. That's so weird. That is. Huh. Yeah. I, yeah. Essentially, you have um, people in government who do not like government. Yes. Yeah. And the result is they dismantle government. And a lot of these things mm-hmm. are really irreversible. Yep. Hmm. Um. Um, I just read this. <laughs> sorry to cut you off. I just read this book called um, Weather by an author named Jenny Offill. And it's um, so it's about this librarian, but she gets a side job basically working for her old professor's climate change podcast, uh, which oh. seemed very relevant to me. Um, but she always jokes that at the end of every podcast episode, every person that her professor interviews she always has to ask them for an obligatory note of hope. (laughs) So I don't want you to think that's what I am doing. Um, (laughs) No. I am, yeah. So uh, there's a lot of talk about hope and, you know, like, is it even, like, worthwhile to talk about hope and that sort of thing? Um, But I guess what I'm really interested in is, um, I guess, like, courage and um, what will help us have courage to face what is coming and what is already here, um, in many ways. And, um, I do, I do see a lot of that, you know, Mm. um, you know, people forever talking about, Oh, the young people are this, or the young people are that. And there's wonderful young people who Mm -hmm. are doing, uh, things like what you're doing, uh, you know, the movements, um, uh, about uh, climate issues, movements about democratic right. issues, about equality, mm-hmm. uh, about fairness, about justice. Um, mm-hmm. You know, idealism is something that we can learn. We, yes. we a lot of people lose it over time, mm-hmm. but you can relearn, relearn idealism in the past. Hmm. And and one of the things that, that I've seen in the climate fiction that I've encountered uh, as I've talked to professors and, and so on is um, they, they feel that they've got to change the stories that we tell each other. Yeah. And that that will change in society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's um why I started this podcast. Um is because I was reading more about that and I've I mean I, I work in business and not like work in marketing as my day job, but um you know, like always been very fascinated by stories, always loved to read, um always wanted to be a writer, that sort of thing. So the storytelling aspect of it has been um, really fascinating to me in the way that climate change has been communicated um, to the public. And yeah, the types of stories, um, I think, is really interesting to me. Yeah, Um, the stories we tell each other shape us. So when I I tell my son the stories of King Arthur and Lancelot Mm -hmm. and heroes, (laughs) yeah, the expectation that person comes away with is about one should be like that. Those are people who are yeah. to be admired. And if mm-hmm. we can tell each other stories about brave creatures like Ring, who stand yeah. stand yeah, up exactly. to uh, the government, if we can tell mm-hmm. each other stories about 
a, a brave submarine captain who says, no, I will not do this thing, which is wrong. Yeah. And, and we've seen that kind of bravery in your American politics. So when mm -hmm. people go and they testify in front of Congress and they say, I saw this, I know this is going to be a terrible thing in my life to deal with, mm -hmm. but I will stand up and I will speak the truth. You know, Colonel Vittman, mm -hmm. what an amazing, brave man to, to mm -hmm. go to the first uh, impeachment hearing. And mm -hmm. because, you know, his life is never going to be the same after having done that. But that's the kind yep. of person we want uh, to, to emulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I think that's good. I'm sure I've overstayed my welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> so, so this has been great fun. Thanks. Thanks for uh, inviting me in. Of course. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that we went for so long, but uh, it was having such a good time talking to you. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, I really enjoyed your book as well. And uh, glad I got to talk to you to learn a little bit more about it and the, the thoughts that went into it. So thank you for coming on the show.